Hi guys, it's your science teacher here with a, another video. This time the video is all about variation and evolution. This is a cool topic as it delves into the age-old question of nature and nurture and it also uh, starts to look at evolution and where we actually came from. So without further ado, let's get started. What makes us different from one another? Is it the fact that we choose to get tattoos on ourselves? Is it the fact that one, some people have brown hair, some people have blonde hair? Is it the fact that we all have different eye colour? Well, in a, fa in a sense, it's all of these. And there are two things controlling our differences. The first is nature, which is our genes. And the second is nurture, which is our environment. And both of these are battling at the same time to control our characteristics. So let's look at some examples of uh, characteristics controlled by our genes. And look at this face over here, his eye colour, the fact that he has brown eyes, that is controlled by his genes. If he was to wear contact lenses to change it, obviously that would be his environment because he would be making a conscious choice. Also, look, his hair colour. That is controlled by his genes. Also, look at his skin colour. That is also another characteristic controlled by his genes. However, there are some characteristics looking at him that are not from his genes. Look at his hair length. He's chosen to spike his hair up in that way. And that's not the only thing that can be controlled by our environment. Scars that we gain throughout our lifetimes are controlled by our environment, as well as if we choose to go on to, in later life to have tattoos. There are a couple which hit the middle ground, I suppose, and they are height and weight, and they are controlled by both our genes and our environment. If we eat well, we are likely to have a bigger weight and a taller height, but some of this is controlled by our genes and our metabolism as well. So, so far we've learned that a lot of our characteristics are controlled by our genes and our environment. But what actually causes a gene to stick? Here I've got an example of two gecko species. Over here we've got a green gecko, uh, which is native to rainforests. And over here, I've got a brown gecko, which can be found in the desert. Now, as you can probably see, they have noticeable differences because over here, this is green and it's blending in with leaves. And over here, this gecko is brown and that would just blend in well with wood and sand, really. But both of these geckos have the same common ancestor. So how did their traits lead them to become different colours? Well, that is down to the process called natural selection. And natural selection works by uh, starting off with a random mutation. For example, if all geckos started off green and then suddenly there was a brown gecko born this would be a random mutation occurring. This random mutation has to be successful to stick. If it is a successful mutation, then the species will go on to reproduce. And this will cause the gene to be passed on. This is actually how giraffes over time have developed such long necks. It's due to the fact that the long necks helped them to get leaves high in the trees. So they kept reproducing as they were most successful and they were the strongest giraffes. And therefore giraffes grew longer and longer necks over time. Characteristics of some species can be controlled. And when we control the characteristics through breeding, we call this 
selective breeding. Down here are two examples of species that have been bred to be incredibly fast. Out here we have a greyhound and we also have a racehorse. Now greyhounds and racehorses have been selectively bred for generations and this is causing them to become even faster and even stronger. And the way this selective breeding works is we pick a horse or a greyhound that has really desirable characteristics and we breed it. Therefore, the offspring has a greater chance of carrying that characteristic. And this keeps on going and going until the gene pool is incredibly strong and you keep getting faster and stronger animals. This doesn't just have to work for incredibly quick animals, it also works for the incredibly cute animals as well. Pugs are an example of a selectively bred animal. They didn't used to be around a few uh, decades ago. Uh, they've been selectively bred to become incredibly small and incredibly cute. However, selective breeding does have a few risks associated with it because of the fact you are narrowing the gene pool. And what this basically means is that if a genetic disorder gets into the genes, it will keep getting passed down and passed down as you are selectively breeding. And with a narrow gene pool, often you take longer to adapt to changes in the environment. Also with this narrow gene pool, sometimes disease can spread as well throughout the population. And this has been seen uh, through selective breeding of many different crop types. If we don't want to take the time to selectively breed a characteristic into a species, then we can actually genetically engineer plants and animals now. And this ha actually has been used, and the technology is available to genetically engineer different species. An example is genetically engineered salmon. Uh, salmon can be genetically engineered in order to produce more of a pink colour. This can mean that it, it, it can look more appealing to a customer. Also, um, as well as genetically engineered to produce this pink colour more, um, they have actually genetically engineered salmon to become a lot larger. Now, this is fantastic for a farmer who is producing salmon because he can make better profit from this genetically engineered product. However, if this species of salmon was to get into the wild population, it could have dramatic effects, okay? So it's important to think about when we're genetically engineering species, to be very wearful that we've got to control it and not let it escape into the environment. Also, some people do not think that genetically engineered products are that safe and there has not been enough research done uh, in order to sell genetically modified products. Another example of genetic engineering is they've actually used bacteria in order to produce insulin. What they've done is they've inserted the human gene, the human allele inside the DNA of bacteria and when the bacteria reproduce uh, they pass on this gene to produce insulin and uh, this causes the production of human insulin which we know from previous topics can be used to treat diabetes. So genetically engineering should be absolutely great, yes? We all agree there is some really great benefits. However, it is not 100% and currently ethical issues are holding it back. One of the main things is uh, that we shouldn't really interfere with the genes of different 
plants and animals and especially people. We know that you can genetically engineer your own uh, babies nowadays called designer babies if you change the genes. But obviously we do not want to create populations where we have manufactured all of the genes as it will reduce all genetic variation and uh, it could also cause um, disease to spread more rapidly throughout a population. Also, it is expensive. Genetically engineering is a very expensive pro uh, project that is going on um, and it's not a hundred percent yet. If you are doing combined science, this is the end of the video for you. Well done for completing it and getting to the end. If you are doing triple science, there is only a little bit to go. And don't worry, because we are looking at the cool topic, which is cloning. So um, this is where we can we make exact replicas of adults. For example, you can make exact clones of plants. Uh, for example, you take an adult plant cell, you can take a cutting from it, and if you replant that cutting, you will get an exact clone of the parent. And this is a plant which you can do this with already. It's called a cheese plant because it looks like blocks of cheese. But if you take a small cutting from that and replant it, it will, ex it will grow and it will be exactly the same as its parent. It has also been done uh, with some animals. Uh, you can clone animals. Um, one way of doing that is by using embryo cloning. And embryo cloning is considered quite safe and is as often used in cows um, to produce clones of uh, the mother. So what happens is you take an embryo um, Cloning has also been done in animals, but not as large a scale as in plants. And in animals, it's often only used with the technique of embryo cloning. And the way embryo cloning works is by producing exact replica children, which aren't the same as the parents, but they are all identical twins. So what you do is you take an embryo, and this often occurs in cows, and what you do is you split that embryo up and you implant it inside surrogate mothers. And therefore, you've got four uh, cells which you can implant inside different surrogate mothers. And you can have four children from one embryo. So one embryo creating four identical children and the, the reason why uh, some farmers do this with cows is because if they have a very productive uh, cow that makes loads and loads of milk instead of using one of the cows which uh, isn't as productive uh, as producing milk uh, to rear a child what they'll do is they'll implant the embryo of the really productive mother so that the offspring has a chance of making more milk when it is born and there is one more type of cloning that we are going to look at to finish the video and that is called adult cell cloning and adult cell cloning is perhaps the hardest type of cloning to do and it has been done before uh, this is dolly the sheep in a museum this is just a replica of a don't worry um and dolly the sheep was the first cloned animal uh, to have existed and the way they did this was they took an adult skin cell out of Dolly's mother and they took the adult skin cell which looks like this and what they actually did was they only took the nucleus out of the cell so here is Dolly's mother's nucleus of the cell and what they did was they took an egg cell of a surrogate mother and they put the nucleus of Dolly's mother inside the egg cell so they removed the egg cell as a nucleus uh, to give space for the nucleus of Dolly's uh, mother. As you can see Dolly was an exact clone of 
her mother. So this is a type of cloning that doesn't involve any sperm. It involves no male reproductive organ at all. So guys, you better watch your back because females could reproduce without us on the planet by doing this type of cloning. Now, thank you ever so much for watching. Please remember, if you did like the video, please drop it a like and don't forget to subscribe to the channel.